Okay, welcome back to our webinar to uh, for a certified uh, power protection specialist course. And again, I'm your instructor. My name is Marvin. Uh, our topic for tonight is special equipment process and uh, facilities. And allow me to greet first the early attendees, Mr. Brian Ang, Mr. Muhammad, Mr. Rahil, and Conrad. Good evening to all of you, gentlemen. <clears throat> Let us proceed. So we will uh, uh, study the power prevention and control of electronic equipment, refrigeration and semiconductor manufacturing, the power protection best practice, the basic operating principle of refrigeration, and hazard control safeguards in semiconductor manufacturing. And in this module, the, the two gentlemen will discuss the precaution related to hot work at building sites and uh, facilities. And uh, the other guy here, Mr. Uh, Bruce, will share this engineering and loss prevention insight related to photovoltaic and energy storage uh, system. <clears throat> so when you completed this module, will be able to recall the topics related to section 89, describe the precaution of hot work, determine the spacing requirements, the chemical or type of equipment used to produce the chemical, and be able to use, uh, to determine whether the vehicle is approved for, depends on the type of classes. No? Determine the suppression system for IT uh, industry, use refrigerant safety group to determine the refrigerant flammability and toxicity, describe three types of refrigeration and determine the best placement of refrigeration uh, system in a given environment. Assess the hazard level given, the refrigerant and environmental condition, identify the fire and health hazard associated with semiconductor manufacturing what is energy storage system and solar application, including its types, and the steps to take during the fire incident that involves ESS and solar system. So we will cover the section eight and nine of the fire protection handbook. Okay. So let us watch a, a, small, uh, a small video. February 8th, 2017. The Packaging Corporation of America's De Ritter, Louisiana Pulp and Paper Mill. An explosion occurred during hot work activities, killing three contract workers and injuring seven others. The De Ritter Mill produces container board that is used in products such as boxes and cardboard displays. The container board is made from pulp produced at the facility. During the process of creating pulp, vapors are generated. These vapors, which can between water, turpentine, and various sulfur compounds, are collected and separated. To separate the vapors, they first enter a turpentine stripping column. There, most of the turpentine is removed and sent to a condenser. The remaining vapors in the stripper condense to a liquid containing mostly water, but also residual amounts of sulfur compounds and turpentine. This liquid is known as foul condensate. The foul condensate is sent from the stripping column to an approximately 100,000 gallon capacity atmospheric storage tank used to store the liquid at or close to ambient pressure. The foul condensate tank is primarily used to regulate the flow of liquid between the turpentine stripping column upstream and a downstream unit that removes the remaining sulfur components from the water. During the February 8th incident, the mill was undergoing its annual shutdown. The shutdown required mill employees and contract workers 
to perform maintenance, inspection, and upgrade tasks throughout the facility. One of these tasks was the repair of water piping, located above and connected to the foul condensate tank that had shifted and cracked months earlier. The repair required welding on the piping, commonly referred to as hot work. In preparation for the hot work, valves were closed leading into and out of the foul condensate tank, while 10 feet of liquid remained in The liquid was left within the tank partially because there were no plans to work directly on the tank during the outage. The company also assumed that the tank contained mostly water, was sealed off from the atmosphere, and did not pose a safety risk. These assumptions were, however, incorrect. Residual turpentine, normally present in foul condensate, collected on the top of the the liquid in the tank due to its density. The foul condensate tank was designed so that by changing the height of the liquid level inside the tank, the residual turpentine would be skimmed off and sent to a turpentine recovery system. But in the months leading up to the incident, the turpentine was not removed because there was confusion as to who at the mill was responsible for operation of the foul condensate tank. Due to this confusion, a valve designed to direct skimmed turpentine to the mill's turpentine recovery system remained closed for months. As a result, leading up to the incident, more flammable turpentine was present in the foul condensate tank than anyone expected. In addition, there are normally vapors inside the foul condensate tank in the space above the liquid. Although those vapors can become flammable, they are supposed to be kept at a concentration that is too rich to burn. But due to the non-routine conditions experienced during the annual shutdown, the contents of the tank likely cooled, creating low pressure within the tank. This most likely triggered a relief valve on the tank's roof to add more air to avoid damaging the tank from the vacuum created by low pressure. The vacuum relief valve was likely one of the few potential sources that allowed enough air into the tank to create an explosive atmosphere. In preparation for the hot work, the water piping was isolated from the foul condensate tank and the rest of the process by closed valves, and the piping was separated physically from the tank. Around 8 a.m. on February 8th, a mill employee used a gas detector to check for a flammable atmosphere in and around the water piping and found none. As a result, the company issued a hot work permit for the welding work. But even though a flammable atmosphere was not present outside the tank, there was a flammable atmosphere inside the tank. Without knowing that the tank posed a serious hazard, three contract workers began welding on the water piping located above it. The CSB was unable to determine an exact ignition source. But it is likely that sparks or molten slag produced from the hot work landed on or near the foul condensate tank, heating up the tank wall or otherwise igniting the contents inside. Or it is possible that the hot work was complete, but as the tools were lowered, a welding torch fell and created an electric arc on the tank or its vent piping. Regardless, the CSB determined that hot work activities likely ignited the flammable vapors and liquid turpentine inside the foul condensate tank. At 11.05 a.m., there was a large explosion. The tank separated from its base and launched up and over a six-story structure, landing approximately 375 feet away. Three people were killed and seven were injured. All were contract employees working near the foul condensate tank. Click next to hear Guy Colonna, professional engineer and senior director at NFPA, present his observations of what you've just witnessed, as well as guidance on hot work best practices.
having watched this video, one of the things that we see highlighted um, from this video in terms of hot work best practices is that the company um, in preparation for the hot work that they needed to be uh, have accomplished that day involved uh, atmospheric hazards. And so they did atmospheric monitoring in the area as part of their preparation and their documentation for issuing the permit. One aspect with respect to atmospheric hazards is that they are changeable. There uh, is potential that um, hazards that you, uh, the, the concentrations don't exist throughout the course of the work. And so it is uh, better practice perhaps to consider continuous monitoring of atmospheric hazards. So as we um, look further in terms of the investigation and the information that the Chemical Safety Board has uh, illustrated through this video, one of the other aspects that is important to not lose sight of, and that is the aspect of as you're planning your hot work, it is important that you understand all the areas where sparks and slag can travel. So if you have high winds, um, they can blow greater distances horizontally. But in this instance, and any time you are doing hot work on an elevated platform, it is important to understand where the sparks and slag can be taken by gravity because they're going to fall down. And in this instance, as illustrated in the video, the work was above that tank where the likely gases and vapors were being emitted from in terms of evaporating and possibly bringing the ignition source from the falling sparks and slag um, into the area where the gases and vapors were present. So uh, in terms of the hot work activities, um, what this video illustrates are some practices that are um, sound practices with respect to preparation leading up to the permit process. Um, but what's important and to take away from the incident is how conditions can change. And that's uh, illustrated very clearly in terms of the atmospheric monitoring and why I suggested that you might consider continuous monitoring anytime you're dealing with atmospheric hazards. And then the second aspect is as part of identifying where your fuel sources are relevant to or relative to where your ignition sources are going to be, anytime you're doing work on an elevated platform, you need to make sure that you have um, guarded the sparks and slag from reaching a point where you might have fuel sources. And that uh, those two items are coupled with um, all of the best practices in terms of hot work. When you're looking at trying to make sure that hot work isn't the ignition source for a fire, there are several things that you can do. One is consider alternatives and just don't do hot work. But if you have to do hot work, you have three alternatives. One of them is to move your hot work to an area where you don't have any hazards. The second is to ensure by distance that you have moved those fuel sources a safe distance away. And that's what gets challenging with respect to any time you're doing hot work on an elevated platform. And then the last uh, option is to shield uh, or protect the um, hot work residues from potential fuel sources. And in this instance, that might have been something that could have been done by um, capturing the sparks and slag um, where they were falling below that elevated area, and then they would not have fallen in the vicinity of the tank below. While Section 9, Chapter 6 of the FPH briefly touches on these topics, there are additional sources of hot work information and training. Uh, in this module, we'll try to examine a variety of specialty equipment, process, and facilities. <clears throat> and now let us discuss the chemical processing uh, equipment. Let's imagine uh, a large oil plant is constructing an on-site fire station. The question is how far from the atmospheric storage tank should the fire station be located? When considering the loss prevention and the processing of facilities, the most important feature is the distance between the site and the populated area. Mm. The distance tends to reduce, of course the objective is to reduce the casualties. The distance of the facility can lessen the effects 
of the gas concentration on the public and the distance will lessen the intensity of the impact or of, of heat or reduce plus over pressure effects on the population. <clears throat> and the one frequently over the consideration for the, for the plan seating is the function of the government and city planning near chemical processing plants. There have been numerous cases where the industrial plants were initially located in a remote area, living on a safe separation from the population. Then the population growth required an increase in homes and other businesses near the industrial plant. To avoid this, a company must acquire sufficient land area surrounding the operation that will be population free. Sometimes the acquisition of additional property is a matter of economics for the operating company. This is why the action on the part of the government is required to maintain a population free area through the zoning restriction. And we know how hazardous it is to be nearby this kind of facilities. A plant that may release toxic gas and potential for major fire or explosion must be designed to high standards of safety and loss prevention. The section eight and chapter two of your fire protection discuss the block approach as one of the method for plant spacing. So what is the block approach? The block, the block approach rely on the assumption that fire or unignited spills of flammable material can be attacked from all direction if they occur on individual blocks of land that are surrounded by the access road. If such access were possible, it would provide freedom to take advantage of both wind direction and shelter afforded by peripheral structure. In addition to consider the distance between the plant and the populated area, it is important to keep, to keep in mind that there are also inter-unit and intra-unit spacing requirements for oil and chemical plants. Let's return to our original question about the placement of fire station on a large oil plant site and using the figure 8.2.1 for the inter-unit spacing requirements in the fire protection handbook. Now this is the question, how far that atmospheric storage stands where the fire station need to be? So select the correct answer. So basically, according to the table, figure uh, 821, okay, the answer is, so what is your answer? <clears throat> so according to the table, it's about, yes, Mr. Rail 350. Okay, so if you see, uh, you can see the intersection here. No? Atmospheric storage tank here no? and uh, here the fire station. Okay, so this is the uh, appropriate table 8.2.1. Okay, so it's just uh, a large version. <coughs> Looking at intra unit spacing requirements. What is the safe spatial distance required between emergency control and high hazard reactor? Answer. So I think you will be going to use the table 8.2.2 because uh, we are unit not on, we are looking on not inter unit intra unit no. So 
figure 822 answer okay let us see so 100 feet um, emergency control and high hazard reactor here no high hazard reactor and emergency control Okay. As a chemical plant process larger quantities of material, it becomes impractical to provide an ever increasing separation of process unit. <clears throat> where toxic and uh, flammable reactive or otherwise hazardous material might be spilled, there are six logical steps to follow. And we can follow the figure 8-21 of your fire protection handbook. So the first one is to minimize the possibility or mitigate the possibility of the uncontrolled spills another is uh, so number two is minimize the size okay. minimize the size of possible spill then minimize the spread of a possible spill Repair alarm and evacuation plan if toxic release can occur. Control source of ignition. And provide protection for the exposed property if ignition occur. That is our last process. And other means of loss control. And the use of the spray water either fixed sprinkler or water spray system with monitor nozzle. It is appropriate method to control the water soluble before from the air. And the strategy also works well for liquid that are expected to be released as a mist into the atmosphere. But it requires a large water supply at a high pressure to be immediately available for the emergency response. Tapping fire water system is typically the way to address this need because they are usually available at the required pressure and volume. Water is not only used for vapor mitigation but exposure protection as well. An automatic fire control and extinguishing system are the first line of defense against the fire and explosion emergency. And those systems require reliable water supply that can provide the needed pressure flow and duration. And again, let's check in our knowledge. The chemical plant service building need to be at what distance from the intermediate hazard process unit. Select the correct answer. So basically, again, we need to go back to figure uh, 8 to 1. Okay. What's B here? I don't know what's B. Okay. But anyway, the answer is 200 feet. So again, how we would read this here? 
and here now. Okay. What is the storage stock spacing requirement for multiple class two floating in cone roof tanks uh, less than 300,000, 3,000 barrels at a petrochemical plant? The answer is, okay. So what's the answer? So the answer here is uh, the 0.5 feet times diameter of the largest tank. And uh, figure eight to three nodes, the, the class two and the three products, the five feet or 1.5 meter spacing is acceptable. That is according to figure 8.2.3 of your fire protection handbook. So you see, flooring and cone root tanks, no? less than or no more than 3,000 barrel. So let us discuss the chemical processing equipment and now the materials handling equipment. Materials handling equipment includes the powered industrial truck and automatic guided vehicles, mechanical and pneumatic stock conveying system, and crane. The section eight and the chapter three of your uh, power protection handbook focus on this special type of equipment. So let us discuss one by one. This account for a large number of vehicle fire reported to you as local fire department including large loss property damage, injury, and even death. We will take a brief look at the types of uh, equipment and the system for handling of material, the fire and explosion hazard inherent to this equipment, and some methods for protection. Lift truck and uh, automatic guided vehicles are typical type of material handling equipment. Lift truck are available in many special design to suit the many use and types of loads to be handled. The forklift and squeeze or clamp lift are the common and may be electrically propelled or use diesel, maybe gasoline, LPG or uh, liquefied petroleum gas, or CN or compressed natural gas. <clears throat> AGB are electric vehicle that are unless recognized by a testing laboratory and properly maintained and operated may produce serious hazard to the industrial plant. These hazards are form of fire, explosion, container damage, spills, and leak. All vehicles should be selected, outfitted, maintained, and operated in according with the hazard of the specific environment in which they are operated. 
and the NEPA 505, the fire safety standard for powered industrial truck, including type designation, area of use, conversions, the maintenance, and operation, list 18 designation of powered industrial truck or tractor. Remember, guys, this number, no? Again, this NEPA 105 listed 18 designation because uh, the previous exam no, asked the same question and maybe it will also come again in your exam. CN means compressed natural gas. D stands for diesel. E is electric. G stands for gasoline. And LP means liquefied petroleum gas. And in addition, the power types are subtype to indicate the level of safeguards for the specific truck. Determined by a recognized testing lab. Example, the type ES truck, okay, ES truck is battery power unit, meets the minimal requirements for type E units and has an additional safeguard for the electrical system to prevent emission of hazardous spark and to limit the surface temperature. The level of safeguarding determine the acceptability of a particular truck in a specific environment, in an occupancy or in a type of uh, occupancy. The various type of industrial truck are limited to the specific location listed in the fire protection handbook Table 8.3.1, again, of your uh, fire protection handbook. The fire and explosion can result if an approved truck types are operated in hazardous location. A potential fire source for G, which stands for gasoline, D, diesel, and CN, compressed natural gas, and liquefied petroleum gas, which stands for LP. Power truck is fuel leak that are ignited by the hot engine, hot muffler, ignition system, and other electrical equipment or other sparks. <clears throat> And in addition, the potential of ignition for the hydraulic oil should be recognized. The danger of ignition is somewhat lower for diesel. Okay, the diesel fuel truck and hydraulic oil because of a higher flash point of this liquid. A special hazard in LPG gas, uh, LPG gas truck is that the bay four are difficult to disperse and tend to gravitate toward lower spots or pits. Care must be exercised with CN and LPG gas to avoid high temperature near oven, furnaces, and similar heat sources the special safeguard in the design of some types of gasoline diesel and on an lpg gas truck help to reduce this fire hazard cn and lpg gas no? but the hazard cannot be completely avoided and the area of use should be strictly controlled to facilitate identification of truck types and their areas of use. A uniform system of marking are developed as shown on your slides. 
using the struct and building marker allow easy and quick recognition of the vehicle approved for the type of location and the use. And let's check our knowledge according to your fire protection handbook. Which of this location is considered class two division one environment. So according to the table 8.3.1, that is the starts grain processing. No? Table 8.3.1 indicate the starts and grain processing class two division one environment. Okay. Another question. So what type of uh, lifting equipment or truck can be able to use in this kind of uh, uh, facility. Again, you can go to page 8-32. Table 8.3.1 of Power Protection Handbook. So that is, the designation is DY. No? Division 1 environment, diesel type DY and electric type EX are approved vehicle. How about the fiber and cordage textile storage? So that is class three division two environment. That is according to table 8.3.1 of your fire protection handbook. And what type of electric vehicle, uh, it, which uh, for location where easily ignitable fibers are stored, which electric vehicle is not preferred, but is acceptable subject to special investigation. So probably it is the, according to 8.3.1, this is for class three division two, E trucks are acceptable subject to special investigation. Okay. Now let us discuss the uh, electronic equipment. Computers and other IT equipment are particularly susceptible to fire damage and accompanying heat steam and combustion product. Elevated temperature may even damage the IT equipment and the data in them. Electronic components and related media can vary in their failure points. Tests have shown that the permanent damage of this equipment and the data storage media can begin at the temperature above 120 degree Fahrenheit or about 49 degrees C at 125 degree Fahrenheit, 52 degree centigrade or Celsius. Magnetic tape, floppy disk, and similar materials start to lose information. Sustained temperature of 150 to 174 degree Fahrenheit or about 66 degree to 79 degree damage to hard disk and other equipment components are apparent. The pressure of high humidity can also be issued at 225 degree Fahrenheit or about 107 degrees C. When human condition, microfilm damage begin. Major components tend to fail at higher temperature at about 300 degrees Fahrenheit or about 176.5, 149 degrees centigrade or more, the paper product 
can be damaged at 350 degree Fahrenheit or about 176.5 Celsius or centigrade. Finally, between 600 degree Fahrenheit and about 750 Fahrenheit, it's about 343 degrees Celsius and 399 degrees C. Polyesterine case and real degrade, producing flammable styrene monomer. For the evidence of this vulnerability, may be seen in a high average of loss per fire in electronic equipment, room fire. Even when they are confined to the object of origin, the section eight, chapter six in the fire protection handbook provides information about the need to protect the electronic equipment. Many system provides suppression and protection variety and electronic equipment. All computer rooms should be equipped with CO2 or carbon dioxide, uh, portable no, fire extinguisher, or a class BC clean agent extinguisher, according with NPA 10 standard or a portable fire extinguishers. The dry chemical extinguisher should not be used if paper or ordinary combustible are present, sufficient number of class A pressurized water extinguishers should also be provided. The occupant need to be instructed on the proper use of the extinguisher. Remember guys, the clean agent and CO2 system leaves no residue. That's why it is the most preferable type of suppression system according to NPA 10. Few computer room meet the definition of light hazard occupancy based on the amount of combustible in the room. In accordance with NPA 13, the standard for the installation of the sprinkler system and automatic sprinkler protection should provide and install on a hydraulic design basis as a wet pipe or reaction system. The special media storage arrangement could affect the sprinkler location and necessary discharge densities. Any area adjacent to the IT area that could cause exposure should also be protected with an auto, uh, automatic sprinkler system. As reported, the US electronic equipment room fire with automatic suppression equipment, according to the research, reduce an average loss per fire by about three fourths or about 75%. So meaning it is really an effective suppression and protection system. Sometimes in number three, the use of gaseous agent in the fixed extinguishing system critical where there is a need to protect data in process, reduce the damage to the valuable equipment, or allow for rapid return to full operation to support the organization business continuity. Where provided, the gaseous agent system should be designed according with NEP 12 or the standard or a carbon dioxide extinguishing system, or most commonly in Qatar, for instance, we are using NEPA 2001, which is a standard for clean agent fire extinguishing system. In the past, fixed total flooding Halon 1301 system are also used. However, serious environmental concern involved with Halon 1301, 
and, and its effect on the ozone layer, consider of alternative means of protection. Replacement agent, also called clean agent, now in the market are capable of handling fire below the waste floor. Selection of substitute agent needs to include the long-term impact on the environment. Okay. Number four, what are the section eight? Chapter six of the fire protection lists the previous three suppression system, as what we discussed earlier, NPA 75, the standard for the fire protection of information technology equipment, now also lists another, the water mist system, this fire protection system, use a verified water spray that is fast acting at reducing both the fire and ambient temperature that may decrease the damage to the sensitive data storage media. Water mist system also minimize water damage and environmentally safe because it is just a mist, just a water mist rather. For the information about the water mist system and their pipe suppression characteristics, you can refer directly to the standard NPA 75. Number five, other means of protection include the use of detection and alarm devices. The smoke detector should be stored at ceiling as well as under a raised floor system. Airflow characteristics of other floor, under floor plenum makes many types of smoke alarm unsuitable. So, so be sure to employ those device specifically, <clears throat> okay, designed for that purpose or intent. High sensitivity sampling type and spot detector should also be listed for the use under the high airflow condition. Alarm and detection system should also be designed and installed according to NFEA 72 or simply National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code in reported U.S. Electronic Equipment Room Fire. There is an associated two-thirds or about 67% reduction in average fire loss where the smoke alarm equipment is present. So basically very effective so, uh, protection system uh, against potential fire, IT fire hazard. The primary purpose of emergency plan, no, we will discuss now the uh, procedure no, is to prepare since there is a plan, okay, is to prepare the key personnel to initiate the action in response to an emergency, such as power failure, severe weather condition, tornado, flood, earthquake, and so on, and whatever potential natural catastrophe. Your emergency plan should outline the action to evacuate the personnel, safeguard system from damage, and contain provision to ensure that a backup copy of data information are available in case of damage occur. You know, part of normally part of business continuity management system is to consider backup the data through cloud or cloud computing system or the use of uh, infrastructure as a service. No? If you want to further know the details of uh, IAA, IAAS, you can go to YouTube <laughs> later, okay? A pre-arranged contingency plan, okay? 
should be included to reallocate the operation or to provide alternative method to maintain critical function of the organization during and after the emergency. The plan normally said as uh, the planning, this is our primary means of uh, uh, mitigating the issue or potential hazard. However, if fail, we have a contingency plan in place. So plan B, you know, considered con contingency plan as plan B. Alternative IT and other office equipment should be available either at another office in the organization or provided by an outside company to continue the operation during the restoration of the damaged ID equipment and data recovery. Supervisory personnel should develop and regularly review this plan and procedure. And the local fire department should be invited to visit the IT and electronic equipment and become familiar with the emergency plan. In Qatar, of course, the civil defense is the one doing this inspection for it to provide a building permit, okay? And uh, uh, of course, you have to pass some sort of uh, functionality test and integrity test of the room. No? Uh, the most important in the uh, clean agent system or IT room, you know, the equipped with this uh, gas suppression system is that the, the required the concentration of those gases must be maintained in some sort of period of time. No? So any potential leakage on the room should be completely saved. Okay, let's check in and use our prop protection handbook a fire investigation revealed that the source of ignition was an office machine located adjacent to the IT equipment room. If an automatic sprinkler was present, what would be the average reduction in the loss based on the existing historical data in the US? This one has been discussed earlier. And according to the research, about 75% or no, three fourths okay, uh, has been reduced for the potential average loss of, uh, in our US electronic equipment room fire. Where in fire protection handbook, can you find which detection system is best suited no? for an IT room with a race floor? So basically, you have to go to page 8-63. So those who are officially enrolled, you already got the material with you. And the page 8-63 of the Power Protection Handbook discuss the detection system best suited for an ID room with a race floor. Which table in Power Protection Handbook provides an evidence of the flame damage and high civilian injury, even when electronic equipment room fire are confined to the object of origin. So basically the answer is the table 8.6.3. And the table 8.6.3 provides the further evidence of flame damage and high civilian injury per fire in an electronic equipment room fire, even when they're confined to the object of origin. So now, um, actually guys, I have some uh, uh, emergency. So if you will permit, okay, and there are many people calling me now, uh, that we will continue the discussion for the remaining section, uh, this coming, uh, Wednesday, and uh, we will also do the quizzes, okay, next meeting, okay. So allow me to go early at the moment now, because we have some uh, important uh, emergency to, to have uh, need to be attended. So that's all for tonight, guys, and we will continue the part B.
of our discussion tonight, okay, about the topic, special equipment, process, and facility. And uh, thank you and have a nice evening to, have a nice, have a pleasant evening to everyone. For tonight, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you and God bless to everyone. Bye-bye.